Good evening and welcome. What a pleasure to see live faces, and I might add also about 1,500 of you uh, online. To those online and to those of you here live at the University of Melbourne, welcome. Let me formally acknowledge uh, that we're on the lands of the uh, Wurundjeri, the Woi Wurrung and the Boon Wurrung peoples who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. And I acknowledge and as we all do and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Now with that, it's my great pleasure to formally kick off this uh, process by inviting the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, uh, Professor Duncan Maskell, to the dais. Uh, thank you very much, Robin, and uh, welcome everybody from me too. I also commence by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands and the waterways of Australia, and I pay my respects to the uh, Indigenous elders past and present. I also acknowledge any Indigenous people here in the Carillo Gantner Theatre this evening. Uh, for the university, and indeed for everyone who is uh, uh, a citizen of this planet, uh, the research findings that will be released this evening are very significant indeed. The Net Zero Australia study is the first of its kind in this country, and it delivers objective and granular analysis by experts of the possible pathways and demands on infrastructure by which Australia can transition to net zero carbon emissions by the middle of this century. This is then a timely and important study, not just for Australia, but for the rest of the world as well. Uh, and that is particularly given that Australia is of course a significant carbon emitter. I think the timeliness of this study is underlined by at least two recent developments. One is the passage by the US Congress this month of President Biden's Climate Action Bill. It's somewhat confusingly titled Inflation Reduction Act 2022, which is a significant step forward in climate policy. The American legislation sets a high bar for countries like Australia for taking action that encourages increased use of solar energy, electric vehicle transport, and sustainably resourced resources, uh, sourced resources for industry. The other development, of course, is the very welcome turn by the newly elected Australian federal government towards stronger policy action on climate change in areas including renewable energy and a proposed national electric vehicle strategy. All in all, these are times where we are seeing positive policy change and today's release of the Net Zero Australia interim findings will be a great research-based addition to the policy conversation in this area. And I would just add that I just think we need hardcore data so much in this area to try and dispel some of the hot air that comes out of some of our uh, colleagues on this issue. Um, as well as my University of Melbourne colleagues, I particularly acknowledge the contribution of the Net Zero Australia project by all the project sponsors and the advisory group. As part of the project work, there has been fantastic collaboration with our project partners, the University of Queensland, Princeton University, and the NAUS group. I thank them all very much for their work with us on this. I think that leading universities should waste no chance to be operating front and center in tackling the world's major challenges. The Net Zero Australia project is a great example of this approach, offering exactly the key contributions that the universities can make. Intellectual leadership, evidence-based analysis, and determination to work with others in helping tackle the world's major problems. In the context of Net Zero, uh, may I briefly mention too, the University of Melbourne's own commitment in this area. Uh, we announced last year uh, that uh, we are not only gonna be net zero carbon uh, by 2025, but we're actually gonna be carbon positive in university operations by 2030. And we are, we are totally committed to this, and I think this is something that's important when we sign up to doing research in these areas and this wonderful work that you're gonna hear about tonight, we also need to walk the walk in this area. So thank you to everybody for being here tonight for the release of these important findings. Um, I'll finish there, and uh, I think we're now going to... Uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce my friend and colleague from the University of Queensland, Vice-Chancellor Deborah Terry. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Duncan. And can I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting uh, tonight and pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. And it is really wonderful to be able to join you tonight, albeit virtually, to mark the release of the interim findings of this groundbreaking study. There is arguably no more important time in history for research such as this to be taking place. We are at an inflection point when it comes to the future of our planet. And the challenge for the global community is enormous. In my view, we need to look at this wicked problem of climate change as an everyone problem. None of us caused climate change by acting alone. Climate change is occurring by all of us acting together. And similarly, none of us will solve climate change by acting alone. We must all act together to transform our energy sources and limit the impact of a changing climate, which is what Net Zero Australia is all about, bringing together top researchers from the University of Queensland and the University of Melbourne in collaboration with Princeton University and the NAUS Group to do the difficult but necessary work of mapping out illustrative pathways for the transition away from fossil fuels. Already this collaborative research partnership has produced unique insights into the opportunities, costs and complexities of decarbonising the Australian economy. And while importantly, the study will not recommend a preferred method for doing this, it yeah. will present costs and benefits of different pathways to net zero by 2050. This will be incredibly useful information for enabling individuals, communities, companies and governments to make better decisions, which is, I believe, the role universities and other research institutions should be playing in this space, providing the science, the research and the analysis to enable the right energy policy settings to be put in place. That, and setting a good example, recognise that increasing energy production climate change can put food and water supply at risk. And as the world increasingly demands more and more energy for human well-being and economic development, we must transition to a greater proportion of that energy being delivered through renewables, which is why we began our own energy transition strategy nearly a decade ago. In total, we now have photovoltaic assets from large scale solar farms to micro grids on remote coral reefs installed at more than 30 sites across our campuses and facilities. And in 2020, UQ became the first university in the world to put in place the capacity to offset 100% of our electricity use with our own renewable power. As both very energy intensive businesses themselves and research institutions, universities have a responsibility to reduce their own <laughs> carbon footprint <laughs> and <laughs> their <laughs> <scientific> <laughs> that, in, that will inform choices for a more sustainable energy future. In other words, we have an opportunity to make a difference to the climate on two fronts, which is what we are attempting to do with our own sustainability strategies and our involvement in and contribution to collaborations such as Net Zero Australia. On that note, I want to congratulate the researchers on this project, and I'm looking forward to hearing directly from the steering committee about the interim findings shortly. And I'm confident that we'll be back here in another year's time to celebrate the overall findings and the impact they'll undoubtedly have on how we move forward as a country towards net zero 2050. Thank you. My thanks to both vice chancellors for 
setting the scene uh, and for providing the leadership that has allowed us to uh, uh, exist and get on uh, with this project. Uh, apologies, of course, for the um, uh, slight uh, perturbations there on the IT side. Uh, these things happen as we all know, but the messages were uh, pretty clear and for that we thank them. Now, we do have an advisory board and I'm delighted that some of the advisory board are able to be with us uh, here tonight. Uh, this advisory board has helped very significantly, as indeed uh, was mentioned by both of the vice chancellors. Uh, we are, I have to be honest here and say we're not beholden to them. Uh, we take their advice very seriously, of course, that goes without saying. Some who aren't able to be with us tonight have pre-recorded messages, so they should just flow straight on. Uh, so we have three such, and let's run through them. Australia is suffering climate damage right here, right now, and we are seeing that through the floods and fires and extreme heat waves and the damaged, damages to the places we love like the Great Barrier Reef. So there has never been a more important time in human history to know how to get our nation to net zero carbon pollution. And that's why the Net Zero Australia project is so important. Now it has a lot of scenarios in it. It should be no surprise that the Australian Conservation Foundation supports fully a renewable powered Australia and getting to net zero as quickly as we can. We should never forget though that solving the climate crisis and getting to net zero will make our country better, will make our country stronger and ensure that the future is safer for all of the people and the places that we love. Congratulations to all those involved in this groundbreaking Net Zero Australia study. It's critical that we consider the full impact of decarbonisation on our economy and our society, on our climate and on people. It's essential that we transition in a way that's both fast and fair and that we leave no one behind. As we develop the jobs of the future, we need to make sure that they are secure jobs, good quality, well-paid jobs, and that we think about the workers, their families, communities and regions that they live in. Which is why we are calling for the establishment of a National Energy Transition Authority, a tripartite body that brings together employers, unions and governments in planning and delivering a just transition. Hi there, I'm Kato Muir, Chair of the National Native Title Council. I just wanted to say a quick video in relation to this launch of the Net Zero Australia project. Uh, Net Zero is a very important initiative for everyone in the world, and in particular, Indigenous people. We're at the forefront of a lot of the developments in this space. We have uh, issues around access to land, and many projects are proposed to be on our. Uh, indigenous estates and in Australia we have land rights, traditional owners, uh, native title lands and many other areas where we also have cultural interests uh, on which many projects, particularly renewable energy projects, will be based. We also have uh, initiatives like the First Nations Clean Energy Network which is looking to include First Nations in the renewable energy sector, either as uh, partners, as uh, proponents, as people who benefit from access to energy security, and also just to ensure that uh, the developments support in things like sustainable development goals and do not have a negative impact on our communities. Finally, there is in the space of uh, moving towards net zero, nature-based solutions uh, is emerging as an area that is of opportunity for many Indigenous peoples, particularly on our estates, but also in the way in which we care for and manage our country. So in this context, all of these issues come together to prove that it is very important for First Nations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be involved in 
the net zero movement and decarbonisation of our environment, as well as reviving, rescuing, maintaining, and bringing our country back to the health and well-being that we once held. Healthy country means healthy people. So I commend the work of the Net Zero Australia project and Paloda Nguranyako. So we thank those members of the advisory board here and those that were uh, able to record messages for us. Uh, they represent so many sectors that uh, the more technically uh, minded of us on this project uh, don't have first-hand and real depth uh, knowledge of. So they've been particularly valuable and we look forward to their ongoing contribution. So now let me uh, let you into the secret of what you're in for. Uh, we've got an agenda here. It will take um, uh, perhaps some of order 50 minutes to dump on you an awful lot of information uh, and results. And then the rest of the time, which is roughly half the time, will be Q&A, both from you who have managed to get here and for those uh, online. So I'd like to... the up on the right-hand side there, you see the members of the steering group outlined, and they're actually going to speak um, in order. Uh, so you can memorize that. There will be a test uh, at the end. Uh, let's start with Catherine Demansky. Thank you, Robin. It's been two years in the making, but I am delighted to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about the, um, the background on the Net Zero Australia study, its governance and its team, because that'll help you frame the results. The Net Zero Australia project has been set up to test net zero pathways within the boundaries of the Australian debate for both domestic and export emissions. There are three key pillars to the study that I think is worth drawing out before we dive into the results so that you can actually get an understanding of how we've approached it. The first pillar is its rigour and granularity, both across time and geography. It uses the work um, and the modelling method used by Princeton for its Net Zero America study in 2020, but has been Australianised. The second element, or the second pillar rather, is that the study is evidence-driven using authoritative sources which are made fully transparent to test the scenarios that we have developed in interactions with our advisory group and others. The third pillar, which I think is probably the most important, is that the study is objective, it's independent, it is technology neutral, and it is non-political. We are making all of our, our findings uh, in the uh, assumptions and methodologies available on our website, which Tom tells me has actually gone live tonight. We have four institutions which, uh, which have collaborated to, in this fantastic piece of work. We have University of Melbourne, we have University of Queensland, we have Princeton University and also the management consultancy NAUS. Of course, the study couldn't get anywhere if it didn't have funding from some very generous sponsors and you'll see them listed there on the left-hand side. Um, working from the ground up, we have Worley, we have Mindaroo, Future Energy Exports, APA, Dow, Future Fuel CRC. And may I make it clear that the, the terms of the, the gifts and grant agreements protect the project's independence. The team has been engaging widely with a broad range of um, stakeholders, as you can see from the advisory group there, to make sure that we are testing the multiple dimensions of this debate. You'll see them listed there with the Australian Conservation Foundation, ACTU, Climate Council, Energy Consumers of Australia, Ethics Centre, National Farmers Federation, National Native Title Council, St Vincent de Paul, independent members and members from our sponsors. The team engaged there to seek critical input to make sure that they, um, they're not missing something, to get feedback on how the scenarios are being uh, considered. But actually, as Robin said, we listen but we don't necessarily agree with what they're saying, we form our own view to, to maintain that independence of our study. 
We've also been engaging broadly. I must say that the STEERCO has uh, in logged incredible hours talking with governments of all levels at the Commonwealth and state level, with NGOs and with other um, research bodies to really test the, the various dimensions. This has been a heated area. We need to make sure that we're actually not going down a path of simply looking at the data without looking at those other impacts that our advisory group has already suggest, uh, mentioned in, in the videos there. Just moving on, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the governance of the, the project and also the team. So this slide actually shows all of, well, just some of the people, I guess, who have been involved here. Moving from left to right, you have the steering committee, which is made up of each of the representatives of the four institutions that I've mentioned, plus also uh, Professor uh, Baderham and myself in an independent capacity. We then have the University of Melbourne team led by Michael Breer, and they were focusing on the power generation, transport and land. University of Queensland team was led by Simon Smart, and they looked after industry, CCS and transmission. Then we have the Princeton University group, which was led by uh, Chris Gregg, and they provided the framework and the modelling, as well as a bit of uh, Australianisation, shall we say. And then uh, followed up with uh, NAUS, which was led by Richard Bolt, leading the work on the mobilisation work stream and also make, uh, pulling together the various reports and making the results accessible. It's been a true collaboration between these institutions. No one would have been able to make such a fantastic project. But I guess that's actually enough for me. I'm going to hand over now to Chris Gregg, who will tell us a little bit about the scenarios and the key insights. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here as well. Um, so we followed more or less the same framework that we used on Princeton study that was released in 2020, as people have said, and which has really formed the backbone of most of the US climate policy. Um, we essentially had, in that, in that case, we had five net zero scenarios. In this case, again, we have five, but they're slightly different. So there's a reference case. So this is a, a business as usual case in which there's no policy change from 2020, no additional emissions constraint, and it's essentially how the model would see the future evolving under those circumstances. We then had two net zero scenarios, which are essentially variations on the demand side. One with very high penetration of electrification, particularly in road transport and buildings, and one with a more subdued um, electrification rate. Uh, both of those have a more or less unconstrained supply side. There's unlimited or no constraints on renewables. Um, there's a constraint on CCS, but it's a constraint that is more than the global deployment of CCS. Then we have two supply side scenarios. So there's a full renewable scenario. This one disallows any fossil fuels by 2050 um, and again has no constraint on renewables. But then there's a renewable constrained scenario which constrains the rate at which we can build renewables to a level which is already substantially more times than the current maximum rate we've ever seen. But it also allows for a larger rollout of CCS um, to, to about a billion tonnes a year. They're fairly consistent with the Princeton approach. The last one, the onshoring approach, is different. Um, whereas all of those other scenarios allowed us to, to switch from fossil fuel exports to clean energy exports, the onshoring scenario allows us to use some of our clean energy production to onshore some production of things like iron and aluminium. Uh, so, so that's our six scenarios. Um, I think they're, they're not a comprehensive list of all the ways you could get there, but we hope they frame the broad array of possibilities. So this is our first public release. Um, we kicked off the project in April last year, um, which essentially corresponded to the fundraising. Um, this is our, our regional modelling work and our first sort of pass at some of the downscaling. By April next year, we hope to be back releasing the final report, uh, and then there's some mobilisation work to go on, you know, how, how this might be implemented in practice that will follow uh, for subsequent months. Uh, a little bit about the modelling. So essentially, in every scenario, we have a linear trajectory from 2020 to 2050 of, uh, to get to net zero uh, for the domestic economy, and the linear trajectory from 2030 to 2060 for the export economy. So this is essentially 
taking our fossil fuel exports and substituting them for clean energy carriers. Could be ammonia, could be hydrogen, etc. Um, we, we looked at a, a whole range of assumptions and, and, and uh, inputs for you know, costs and those sorts of things, and we came up with what we thought was the most credible and, and, and reputable arrangement. We'll do a bunch of sensitivities to test the, the sensitivity on those. And essentially, one thing we should always remember, the scenario is not a forecast. It's essentially the least cost-optimised pathway um, with the assumptions that we have in place. The real, I think, unique thing that we do then is to downscale these changes. So to get them down to a very fine spatial granularity over time, what gets built and where. Uh, in terms of designing the scenarios, I've really talked about that already. Um, again, they, we think they reflect the more or less the boundaries of possible ways that Australia could get there with some reasonable limitations, like some limit on the amount of carbon that can be stored in the subsurface, um, we have no nuclear, for example, because that's you know, not permitted at the moment. We will run a sensitivity with what happens if we do have nuclear. Um, you know, I think what the study does is, I think, hope to give people an appreciation of the ways you could get there, the level of complexity, the scale, the speed, and some ideas about costs. Um, show you that there are multiple pathways. You know, we don't have a preference for the pathway to get there. Our attitude is the best pathway to net zero is the one you actually get done with all the constraints you have. But hopefully we get people to think about how they can contribute and, and, and how some of these changes could be managed in practice. What I would stress is that they are not forecasts. Um, they are a scenario or a group of scenarios. For example, we don't consider what could happen to fossil fuel prices in the future. We have a relatively low fossil fuel price history uh, forecast, which of course today we're seeing very high costs. Um, and we don't model the demand for clean energy. We basically are saying that the energy carriers we export today would be maintained at the same level. Um, that, that needs to be tested. In terms of key insights, um, we think there are 10 that are important. Um, we think that renewables will likely produce most of the domestic energy, or in some cases all of it, by 2050. Um, we're going to need to be more productive with the way we use energy, uh, and, and if we are, we can keep energy use at, at less than it is today, despite a growing economy and a growing population. CCUS, carbon capture, utilisation and storage, played a role in all of our scenarios and they're an important complement to renewables. Uh, it's capital intensive, so net zero, all the net zero pathways are more capital intensive than business as usual for the energy sector. But there are benefits to this. We, we, that we have lower ongoing operating costs and the share of energy costs as a percentage of GDP need not rise. Um, in terms of exports, we do have the potential to substitute our, our fossil exports with clean energy exports. And while the cost of those may rise, there is no reason to believe that Australia can't be a competitive producer and, and exporter of, of um, clean carriers. One important uh, uh, finding is that there's a huge workforce involved. So we're going to have to mobilise that workforce, we're going to have to uh, generate the skills, uh, and a lot of these new jobs are likely to be in regional Australia. Um, emissions from the land sector, so forestry, waste, um, farms, will come down, we think, uh, but we, they may not reach net zero, and so we, we, we can't rely on that to offset continued emissions from the industrial and energy sectors. And I think another big finding, and you'll see this later, there's a, the, a massive increase in, in land use for, for, for the energy sector. Uh, and uh, changes in landscapes and seascapes, and these are going to have to be managed very carefully, and we're going to have to get, engage with uh, communities very sensitively. So that's a kind of high level, and I'm going to hand to the two university leads to do the deep dive on what we did. Thanks, Chris, um, and thanks everybody for being here. It's a real pleasure to prevent, present these findings. So um, let's step into these key messages then. So the first, that renewables will produce most or all of the uh, domestic energy demand by 2050 across all the scenarios. 
So we can see from this chart of primary energy demand broken down by energy source, that solar in the gold color and onshore wind in that blue color account for about half to two thirds of domestic energy supply by 2050. Offshore wind in, I guess it's an oceany greeny blue and biomass in a more vibrant green also feature. For onshore wind, that comes after 2030 as costs fall. And lastly, remembering that this is primary energy, we do see that natural gas in the purple and oil products in the deep red play a significant role in all scenarios where they are allowed to. So these energy sources are always integrated with CCS and supply parts of the transportation sector, for example, aviation fuels and some heavy vehicles, as well as commercial, residential and industrial sectors that have not or indeed cannot decarbonize or sorry, undergo electrification by 2050. On the next slide, we see two charts of gener electricity generation capacity for wind and solar on the top and storage and firming generation on the bottom. And here we start to understand the scale and pace required with the rate of renewable capacity addition much higher than historical averages or historical maximums, in fact. Offshore wind plays a larger role in the RE minus case as solar and onshore wind are constrained in their deployment. And so offshore wind is called upon to do, to meet a larger component of the energy demand. The second takeaway is that by 2050, all scenarios require between seven and nine times the size of the current national electricity market, or the NEM. In the bottom chart, we see that storage, modeled as batteries in that lime green and pumped hydro in purple, if hopefully you can see it there, um, is significant with around 50 to 100 gigawatts required across those scenarios. That's around two NEM equivalents. And lastly, the firming required to balance the system is around 25 to 50 gigawatts, predominantly gas turbines in the orange and pale purple colors, utilizing a decarbonized gas. And again, that's around a half to a full NEM equivalent. On this slide, we see that more productive use of energy can keep final energy demand at about the same level it is today, despite population and GDP growth. The reasons here are twofold. The first is electrification. Switching energy service demand, for example, heating your home or driving a vehicle to the electric equivalent, like a reverse cycle air conditioner instead of gas heating, or using an electric vehicle instead of a petrol one. Now that accounts for about 60% of the difference that you see between the E plus and E minus cases and the reference case. It's also why the E plus in that uh, brownie color, um, which considered higher electrification, has a greater reduction in final energy demand than the E minus case in the maroon. The second reason here is improved energy productivity, upgrading technologies that are already in use. And those efficiency savings account for about 40% of the difference between the net zero scenarios and the reference case. Carbon capture utilization and storage play an important role in all the scenarios. CCUS is needed for reducing emissions in non-energy industries like cement and chemicals and for producing negative emissions, carbon sinks, so to speak, using direct air capture technology where CO2 is taken out of the atmosphere. Our modeling shows that CCS is adopted and quickly implement, implemented to the maximum injection rate of around 150 million tonnes in three of the five scenarios. In the RE minus case, where renewable build rates are constrained, albeit at several times historical maximums, then CCUS is required to help us reach net zero and maintain our export of clean energy. By 2060, in this particular scenario, injection rates approach a billion tonnes a year. That's the dotted gold line that you can see quite prominently there. And even in the fully renewable scenario, the RE plus, 
That's the pale green line towards the bottom. Provide, um, CCUS is critical in achieving our net zero ambitions, effectively providing the negative emissions required to net out other sectors like industry or even agriculture, forestry, farming and waste. In this case, the rate of CCS peaks around 2045 at just less than 100 million tonnes a year, after which it declines to about 50 million tonnes, which represents the unabated or indeed unabatable emissions from other sectors of the economy. So Chris alluded to this before, unprecedented capital investment is needed, but it will produce significant benefits. And that's not unsurprising given that our current energy system and indeed our entire economy is built around fossil fuels, which require, and so we will require much higher investment around one and a half to 1.8 times the reference case, which continues our use of fossil fuels. But that black line there does not account for the costs of inaction on climate change, which is outside the scope of our work. And importantly, it's not shown in that black line. But we know this to be substantial. There's an awful lot of work that shows that this is really substantial. And the investment in decarbonisation will avoid these costs. In addition, decarbonisation will reduce our reliance on oil and gas imports and the associated price shocks that we're seeing play out in real time here and now. And it will reduce the impacts of potential supply chain crunches that may arise for technologies that use fossil fuels, like petrol cars, things that we import, and they may become less available. When we consider this as a, co as a percentage share of GDP, we find that domestic energy share need not rise above today's levels. In the best cases where there are no constraints on the energy supply mix, that's the solid lines, the maroon and, maroon and black, brown, it actually falls as a share of our economy compared to today. If we introduce constraints like a fully renewable build or one where we can't build renewables fast enough, then we see that costs remain relatively constant as a share of GDP, although there is a peak for that gold RE minus line around 2045. Turning to our exports, our modelling shows that Australia has the resources to build a clean energy export industry. And that's what you see there in the middle chart, where the 15 exajoules of coal and LNG are progressively shifted from those fossil fuels to clean energy carriers, like hydrogen or ammonia. Green hydrogen from electrolysis is projected to be the largest source of those exports in four out of the five scenarios. But blue hydrogen from reforming of natural gas with CCS can contribute a major share if we are unable to keep up with the required rate of wind and solar build. The chart on the right shows how we are able to onshore the processing of minerals like iron ore and alumina into iron and aluminium. This onshoring scenario considers what we would look like if we were to abate scope three emissions of these minerals inside Australia, rather than exporting them to other countries, accompanied by our own clean energy or our own clean hydrogen to process them into value-added products. Recognising that onshoring is difficult, requiring Australia to build infrastructure and train workers to compete against vastly more experienced trading partners, we've chosen to focus on the first stage of this um, value-add, looking at iron rather than the more complex steel. We've also only considered the established exports, of which iron ore and alumina are the most emissions-intensive by far. So as we progressively process these minerals onshore, effectively providing zero emissions products, we see both the efficiency gains from avoiding converting hydrogen to a carrier and then ship it and then back again at the export destination, and also that the most prospective export zones coincide well with the established iron ore export industry. Onto the costs of the export side, we find that whilst the cost to export clean energy may rise, it should be competitive in a decarbonising global economy. You can see from the chart on the left that levelised costs per unit of energy by 2050 are substantially higher than pre-COVID. But they are comparable to current crude oil and LNG spot prices. Now I know we're talking costs here and prices in that same sentence. Um, 
And I suppose the other caveat here is that all these scenarios, as Chris pointed out, were set before this uh, current energy crisis happened. So our reference case, the black line down the bottom there, has to be considered optimistic in light of current events. Levelized system costs, which is the chart on the right, rise from around $90 billion to $600 billion a year in the future. Although importantly, we would expect these costs not to be paid by Australians, but borne out by those investors who want our clean energy. Now, all the scenarios show similar trajectories, and there's not a lot of differentiation between them, although if you look carefully, you can see the RE minus gold case, actually, which meets our clean energy exports with blue hydrogen, appears marginally more cost effective than the others across the transition. And with that, it's my great pleasure to pass over to my partner in crime, Professor Michael Breer, to take us through the next bit. Thanks, Simon. And uh, good evening, everybody. OK. Uh, I'll pretend to be a labour economist and a specialist in agriculture and forestry, but I'm really a mechanical engineer. Uh, so I'm speaking on behalf of some wonderful people, particularly when it comes to workforce. Julian McCoy, Erin Mayfield, who's online from Dartmouth College in, the, in upstate, in the northeast United States, and Dominic Davis. So on the jobs here, we see on the left-hand side the domestic job creation for each of these scenarios, and on the right-hand side, the export sector job creation. And you can see that by mid-century or so, we've added a couple of hundred thousand, plus or minus, uh, for the domestic sector from about a hundred or so thousand that are currently working in the sector today. On the right-hand side, you can see a much larger growth, and that's simply because there's so much more energy that we send offshore than we consume here, so there's going to be a lot more people needed to build the stuff to send that stuff offshore. Importantly, in both of these cases, about uh, two-thirds of the people who, who uh, will do all of this uh, are VET and uh, high school graduates, and around about one-third uh, are university graduates. <coughs> Overall, of this 1 to 1.3 million workers, remembering that over this 30-year period we're projecting the Australian population to grow by about 50% at the same time. That's why the GDP grows and numbers look better on the cost previously. It, with, with such a, uh, a projection, the domestic energy on its own would not make the energy sector a, a large employer compared to healthcare and several other sectors that we currently have today. The employment required, however, to build our clean energy exports could make energy a, ma a major uh, employer by mid-century, but it wouldn't be our largest by mid-century. Um, now, those jobs, though, of course, it's still very substantial, but those jobs would mostly be across northern Australia. You'll see why in a moment, um, which we would then expect to be uh, have uh, added uh, population growth to build the communities, to build the towns, to build this stuff. Um, now, of course, that kind of activity, particularly if it's across uh, uh, regional uh, Australia, has significant implications for a lot of people, particularly the First Nations uh, peoples, national security, and of course, immigration. Um, by the way, unsurprisingly, a lot of these jobs are technical skills, but there actually is a very strong heterogeneity. About two-thirds of these jobs, as I mentioned before, are vet and high school graduates, and not just university graduates, but also, and I haven't shown this, the 10 most popular professions only constitute about a third of all the jobs created. So there's many different types of workers. Lots of different jobs for lots of different people across the nation. Now, talking to, uh, th thinking about the land sector, Emissions from farms, forestry and waste should fall, but are unlikely to reach net zero on their own. For this piece of work, I thank some different specialists, Maria Lopez Peralta, uh, Richard Eckard, Rod Keenan and Brendan Cullen from our faculties, uh, our, our specialists in forestry and agriculture. Here you can see uh, what looks on the surface, one result, but there's actually months of analysis that went into this result, 
uh, and you can see what we call waste agriculture and Lulu CF. There's another part of the test at the end of the night that Robin will wait. What's Lulu CF? Land use, land use change and forestry. It's, it's one of my favourite acronyms in, the, in, in this area. So what we're seeing here is that uh, 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 we can do lots of clever things with agriculture, remembering that the country is getting 50% bigger, but then again, so are some of our neighbours, and we're not projecting we're all becoming vegetarians. Um, uh, but we can do lots of clever things. We can revegetate land, we can uh, add feed supplements to livestock, we can put in slow-release fertilisers, so on and so forth. But whilst we project that land sector emissions will fall as agricultural production increases, we find that this sector doesn't doesn't reach net zero. Now, if you look at that number on the right-hand side there, the, the net zero emissions, it's about 15, 20 million tonnes. But remember, we're talking about avoiding right now about 1,800 million tonnes, so it's approximately zero relative to 1,800. But that's achieved by that Lulu CF change, which is replanting on, on non-irrigated farmland, farmland in our modelling, and it's about 8% of non-irrigated farmland about 5 million hectares. Now, a more ambitious projection for replanting on farmland or other land would drive land sector emissions below zeros, and other studies have proposed that. And in our ongoing work, we'll look at those sorts of trade-offs. But these results nonetheless mean, and this is an important result for the engineers in the room in particular, but all of us, nonetheless mean that the energy uh, sector and industry may not be able to rely on offsets from the land and waste sectors to reach net zero. And if that's a reasonable statement, then other forms of carbon drawdown, such as direct air capture and CCS, will then be required to reach net zero. Now, to give you some idea of what this downscaling effort we're talking about, and Chris mentioned it earlier on, it's, it's mapping. Um, give you an idea, therefore, of the, of, the, of the large changes in land and sea use that will occur. And of course, when you start to look at these maps, you can see very immediately that we will need careful planning and very careful and sensitive community engagement. Here is a map of our beautiful nation. And uh, Robin first coined the terms of solar Tasmanias. I think Robin, Robin did that one. And for this particular scenario in mid-century, it's a net zero scenario, and we can see several solar t Tasmanias um, um, on, on this map. Now, um, we're also seeing an immense level of uh, transmission, both electricity and hydrogen. But we do emphasise that this work is preliminary, and these results will vary significantly as we analyse different assumptions. As, as a colleague of ours said a day or two ago, the future is what we choose it to be, and I add in, and not what we model it to be. <laughs> now, we'll talk a little bit more about these downscaling results, and you'll start to see the rapid pace that's required to get to net zero by mid-century. Before I go into that, though, I just remembered I got a caveat slide. Um, uh, we're presenting early downscaling results, these illustrate land and sea use changes, um, and these are preliminary efforts, but you can see the downscaling work is continuing, uh, uh, and I can't read that with my glasses, uh, yet to be finalised, caveat, uh, uh, and most importantly, you can see very immediately from that preliminary result that people who have a deep interest in and regard for the land are going to have to be involved in this effort very, very carefully and from the get-go. Um, so, now I'll get to the slide that I thought I was going to get to, which was the pretty picture. So here's, here's Australia uh, today, and if you, you, you can see some lovely little fine lines. They're the current National Electricity Transmission Network. If you look around, say, down in the southeast, you can see some dots the bigger dots are wind farms. If you squint, you'll see some smaller dots that happen to be sort of yellowish in colour. They're solar farms. Um, that's what we have right now. So we're going to step through in time out to 2050. That's 2030. So we've built 100 gigawatts of solar PV in the subsequent eight years. 
you can start to see along the top these big export zones starting to appear. 2040, again. And 2050, now you can see these solar Tasmanias that I mentioned earlier. So in this case, this is a, uh, uh, a mid-century result, you can see that we have um, a couple of terawatts of solar. That rolls off the tongue pretty easily, doesn't it? That would be 2,000 gigawatts or 2 million megawatts. Is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't like doing maths on the fly in a public lecture. Um, even less than I do with my son's year 12 maths homework. But anyway, um, uh, so a couple of thousand gigawatts of solar, uh, a, a lazy 130 gigawatts of onshore wind and 40 gigawatts of offshore wind. And that in, to in total is about 40 times the capacity of the current national electricity market. Now remember, most of that though is servicing the rest of the world, not us, okay? And that's very, very important. Simon mentioned, others will, should pay for that, not us, and others should provide an awful lot of the technical know-how and maybe even a lot of the labour, we'll see. Now, um, this preliminary work though, I will say a couple of things. This work right here does uh, exclude, for example, lands for which exclusive native title has already been granted, lands of higher conservation value and biodiversity impact, irrigated and higher value farmland, and of course, higher, popu higher population density areas, defence areas, so on and so forth. And to, the, to my previous point, working closely with people who understand the land is therefore essential for the nation and very, very important for us as we finalise these maps. So we're very, very grateful indeed for the ongoing assist assistance in, in this effort, this, particularly this mapping effort of the Native Title Council, the Conservation Foundation and the Farmers Federation. Remember though, the future is what we choose it to be. For example, our investment modelling, this is a critique of our modelling because it's not perfect, our investment modelling assumes that any piece of capital equipment, whether it's made in the, put, installed in the Pilbara or Hobart, costs the same. We also assume that required labour will be available anywhere to build and maintain that investment. That's just the nature of the modelling. We can't solve everything all at once because we'd be running forever. These are both big assumptions, but they result in export from regions of best renewable resource. So the sunny, hot, dry bits, particularly across the north. However, and if a state in particular is very proactive, let's say by expediting approvals, by helping attract investment, and that state has a larger regional population, it is plausible that this state will attract more of this export-oriented investment. That is, it could outcompete a more remote region's superior renewable resource with lower costs, fewer delays, and lower risks. And we're gonna, once again, study those trade-offs as well because we find in general a lot of these optima are pretty flat mathematically and the future is what we choose it to be. I'll skip through some more specific maps, but I'll go pretty quickly on those, I think. We're doing all right for time, are we, Robin? I'll go a little less quickly then. Um, and, uh, and then we, you, you'll see your hometown, no matter where it is, hopefully across the nation, uh, uh, close in. So South East Australia, we'll start um, uh, where, roughly where we are. And you can see here in 2020, there's beautiful Melbourne and Sydney and all of Tasmania and Adelaide. So we get, a, we get four capital cities in one fell swoop. And we can see this, the wind that already exists, the transmission and so on and so forth. In 2050, that's the kind of map we're looking at. It's indicative, but that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And you can see there straight away, lots of wind, lots of solar, for this E plus scenario, this is not the 100% renewable scenario, this is the E plus scenario. And interestingly, a um, very substantial amount of offshore wind, um, which has been a pretty big deal uh, uh, for those of us in Victoria in the last year or so with various significant developments across the nation, of course, but significant stuff happening here. But offshore wind across Victoria, some off Tasmania, um, uh, we, we can, uh, uh, as we refine this modelling, no doubt the siting of these individual assets will move around and so on and so forth. What about South West Australia? There's Perth and Surrounds and a few lovely uh, uh, wind farms outside of Perth. 
By 2050, there's the energy system serving Perth. And by the way, this big, long green transmission line that's going across, ultimately across the Nullarbor and just north of Adelaide, um, um, we're seeing remarkable transmission build, but we're seeing remarkable build in general. Then if we go to southeast Queensland, there's Brisbane a few, and, and northern New South Wales. There's 2050 in the E-plus scenario again. Lots of wind and solar and, and, and very substantial transmission augmentation up the east coast. And then if we go, Queensland gets two because it's Queensland, it's special. <laughs> and it's also 3,000 kilometres long, I think, isn't it? Um, uh, central Queensland, so we can see from the bottom there is Fraser Island up to, I think, Mackay. Um, uh, uh, a little bit of uh, transmission line, a few bits and bobs in terms of renewable assets, but by 2060 you're seeing some of these big export hubs coming in and taking the green energy out um, to our friends, uh, uh, primarily in Southeast Asia. So that's me done. Thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Richard Bolt. Thank you, Michael, and uh, greetings from me as well. It is wonderful to be here and to see everyone here and to know that there are many online. So um, you've seen a, a particularly impressive dissertation on all the work that's been done. I'll look forward more uh, than back on the work that has been done and talk about the approach we plan to take to something we're calling the mobilisation work stream. And this is a synopsis of what that work stream is looking to address by way of, of its, its goals. So what are we mobilising? We're mobilising, we, we're going to ask the question, how would you mobilise, how might you mobilise the enormous amounts of capital the deployment of assets, the coordinated withdrawal of assets that will actually achieve what the model says under those scenarios and those constraints uh, would happen. And uh, it's not just a question of the economic, financial and industrial uh, mobilisation that's required, it's also a question of what, of mobilising the public support that is needed. You cannot do the amount of change that you've seen in front of you on, 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 the, on the screen in terms of workforce growth, land use change, impact on First Nations uh, native title um, uh, uh, rights. Uh, you can't do all of that without considerable engagement of the public and a great deal of attention to the impacts that would need to be mitigated and the benefits that would need to be shared. And that isn't only about land use change, and as you can see from the four goals that sit in front of you, we're taking a very broad view from the mobilisation uh, uh, task to managing the workforce and regional change. Some of that is about contraction. There are clearly industries and regions that will decline. There are others that will grow massively. The solar Tasmanias are the obvious example of that. And managing both decline and growth, and in some regions both, is going to be a focus of the mobilisation work. Um, I've mentioned landowner and community benefits. It's not only massive solar farms or concentrations of solar farms and wind farms, as you've seen. Uh, it's also the linear infrastructure, the pipelines, the transmission lines and so forth that will all need to be accommodated. And without um, uh, due attention to the sharing of benefits, the engagement of those who are affected by it, uh, there would be the potential for a constrained rollout. So we're going to ask the question, how would you mobilise support from those communities and landowners as well. Um, and then not to forget householders. So the voters, uh, the, the, the residents of the country are going to undergo quite a substantial transition. We have a large focus on asset deployment at a large scale that you've seen. Uh, there's also a lot of asset deployment and change going on that will need to go on with households and within small businesses. And, uh, and that investment is quite substantial. It is, in fact, modelled um, as part of this exercise. Um, and to bring those sectors or that, that, those cohorts uh, along is clearly going to be a large element of, a large ingredient of success. So we will ask the question, how can that be done? And then finally, as much as um, uh, decarbonisation has a clear and compelling environmental rationale, 
it can also clearly have an environmental detriment, again, if not well managed. And the amount of land use change is the reason for that, which you've obviously seen all of the pictorial representations of here. Biodiversity impacts in particular, but others besides, will all need to be carefully managed in what would be uh, an extremely uh, demanding, but ultimately highly beneficial transition where those modelling results However they actually play out, whatever future we do decide to invent, we'll have to manage it with great care and attention, with great ambition, and the mobilisation work stream. We'll not attempt to say that we know how to do it, so much as to say, well, these are ways it could be done, and these are their pros and cons. So with those goals in mind, what activities does the mobilisation work stream propose to undertake? First of all, as you've just seen, um, uh, we will continue the idea of being illustrative, which is to say, what do the decarbonisation timelines look like from the point of view of different cohorts, obviously householders, uh, different regions, such as the Pilbara's we've seen, um, different sectors of the economy, and you'll see in, in uh, material that I'll present later, just, I'll just quickly refer to later, uh, that we've done a lot of sectoral analysis that will inform these illustrative uh, the illustrative aspect of the mobilisation work, particularly the construction of these timelines. Uh, it will feed off the modelling. The modelling has, has got it within it, all of the material, uh, once extracted, that will allow us to tell these stories from the point of view of those uh, segments that I've mentioned before, I mentioned down there, which is the, the cohorts, the sectors and the regions. We'll then look at the kinds of methods and strategies that could mobilise the investment and the public support, and mitigate the impacts, um, identify them, assess them with a particular focus, not only on individual measures, but the total package, uh, packages of measures that you would call strategies that could be deployed. And, uh, and look at various of those from which we will develop insights and guidance that will uh, hopefully be useful to governments, to households, communities, industries, and uh, picking up Michelle uh, O'Neill's point to unions as well, to mobilise and manage the transition. So that work has essentially only been planned in a conceptual sense, and I thank my colleague Tom Strawhorn for his collaboration, of course, the steering committee and our advisory group for their input to that, but the real work is ahead of us on mobilisation. So uh, we're, uh, it's all also falls to me to talk about our next steps as a, um, as a project, and you've seen a variation of this slide already. We are at August. Um, we began in earnest in April, as you see, but, but the actual construction of the project and the fundraising started pretty well a year before that again. So it's been a long journey to get to August 2022 and the regional modelling and draft downscaling that you have just seen. Eight months from now, we plan to put out the final modelling report and the amount of work that the, the many people involved, the presenters that have, you've already seen, people like Dominic Davis sitting over there, Andrea Vecchi somewhere in the audience, uh, and many others that, that have been on screens. There's a lot to do by, by them to produce a final modelling report in April, which will, um, uh, which will refine the downscaling, extend the downscaling, model sensitivities, and come up with um, a, a more, um, well, when I say final, a more final view of what these scenarios would mean if they played out in reality. And the mobilisation report will follow a few months later, once, uh, once all of that work has been completed, feeding off the modelling that would have been released a little earlier. So we are a year away from completion and two major milestones in between, and we certainly hope to get your rapt attention for all of that work in the interim. The last point I did want to make uh, and uh, concerns the website. So up until now, we have been, as an organisation, um, invisible internet-wise, we are now visible because 15 minutes before this uh, session began, Tom um, uh, made the, uh, the website live, the website that was led in its construction by Anita LaRosa sitting over there and uh, in, in conjunction with a working group that both of them have put uh, sweat and blood into, if you like. Uh, I don't think tears, but certainly the other stuff. And what you'll see on there is, is a lot more information and detail than you have, than we've had time to go through tonight. Um, many more breakdowns of data, many more angles on the decarbonisation journey, and it's, it's really a worthwhile read, very pictorial, very engaging. It's not extremely dense writing, and it's, it's accessible, 
and very, very thought-provoking. And you, you can just see a sample of the slides that, that are in the public pack sitting on the website right now, available for you to access. We've talked about our, our transparency. This on the uh, top right here is our mass pack. Methods, assumptions, sensitivities, scenarios, or the other way around. Uh, the mass pack is 200 pages of, that is extremely dense text, that, that lays bare what our cost assumptions are, what our, what our methods are, and it's an attempt to be very clear that uh, if you want to understand why those results exist, that mass pack will give you great insights into why particular technologies do or do not become competitive in particular places at particular times. And finally, uh, Michael went through the employment impacts and there's a more detailed report on that on the website now. So please visit it and, and, uh, and stay in touch with it because I think it'll be a very interesting site to, uh, to learn from as time goes on. And that's enough from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And uh, could I invite now the uh, members of the steering committee who you've heard for individually to take the uh, places on the stage and we'll open up for discussion both uh, online and from those of you that are here. Now, while they're comfortably seating themselves, uh, as you would expect, I might um, run through what I would suggest are some rules of the game. Um, first of all, please remember that these are interim results. Uh, there is going to be discussion over the assumptions and on the scenarios uh, that we're running and so forth. And we do welcome that. Uh, we welcome uh, constructive uh, comments and feedback. Uh, there will be uh, links on the website and an email address. And to the extent that we have the resources, of course, uh, we will um, engage uh, with you and take these on the board. Uh, we can't guarantee to take everything in, of course, but I do hope we can cover a lot of it. Uh, Consistent with this being technology neutral, evidence driven and non-political, we welcome feedback. So we don't have any particular position. Um, that said, tonight I would encourage you both online, and we've got a pile of online questions uh, already, online and live, please to stick to questioning not launching into one hour long statements of position and justifications of them. Um, if you do that, I don't have any method of stopping you, I might add, uh, other than just being plain rude, uh, which I'm quite capable of doing. So on that basis, uh, for questions, uh, so that the online people can hear the question as well, and rather than me repeating it, uh, we do have uh, some roving mics which can uh, be run around, uh, and so we'll see how that goes. So please use the mic, state who you are and uh, where you're from, uh, and give us a question. So while somebody is raising their hand from the audience so the mics can start moving to them, mm -hmm. let me uh, go online and open the questions up. And the... Uh, system is working, wonderful. Uh, I might start with you, Michael, uh, if I may. And it's on renewable energy exports. And the uh, question is, uh, the location of energy Tasmania's doesn't seem to align with the renewable energy zones defined by AEMO in its ISP. Could you please comment? Uh, I, think I'm, I think I know the answer to this one. Uh, but the ISP doesn't consider exports and the amount of energy that we're projecting to export, which is uh, the same amount as we currently export, is twice the amount of the energy that we consume. So therefore, we'll need um, bigger and more uh, renewable energy zones if we're going to meet both the export and the domestic uh, supply tasks. 
Michael, thank you uh, from that. Um, I'll try and keep it uh, so that you get the maximum chance to answer questions. I'll try and keep it to uh, one person answering each question, despite hands being raised at this end. Uh, we would all like to um, um, put things in, and then everyone will get a chance to answer questions. They can chuck in their extra bit um, at that time. Simon, if I could move to you with uh, one offline, and then we'll start balancing it up, folks. Um, so, Simon, will the emergence of renewable energy exports mean that Australia is exposed to export parity prices? And should we have a domestic reservation policy? So I, I might throw to Michael on that last no. part there. No, no. Um, so um, we, Net Zero Australia as a, as a project didn't model um, the energy export market. We didn't model those, that market. We didn't model those prices because the future in that respect, where, as it comes to... Um, who will demand the product, when they will demand it, um, is extremely uncertain. Um, and so what we've, we've done is we've fixed our energy exports at uh, a constant level, um, and then we are focusing on costs rather than prices. Um, so in a globally de decarbonising world, um, we believe that the, um, the energy exports that we produce would be economically competitive. Um, but we have, you know, it, it's outside the scope of the work that we're doing um, to be predicting, you know, how energy markets will behave into the future. Um, in terms of the uh, reservation policy, um, I think that's a, it's a very interesting question, actually, one, and one that we're, we're still considering as a, as a research team. Please, uh, from the audience over here. Deb Kerr, I'm the CEO for the Victorian Forest Products Association. So, um, really interesting piece of work. It seems that the proposals in your interim findings sets up a feed, feeding the world versus energising the world, if I could put it that way, and certainly impacts on, you know, the amount of land available for agricultural production, producing fibre for Australia. So I'm just wondering whether there was any considering, consideration of that export model versus the sort of agriculture and, and wood fibre in particular is my interest. Michael, who's frowning, which says he doesn't want it, but um, <laughs> I might ask Michael to respond because this business of the trade-off with the land and what you do with it is really critical. And even if you take the exports out of the picture, you've still got to come to position on the land bit. So, Michael. So I caveated my, my discussion of the land sector with I'm not a forestry or agricultural specialist, but we have one in the room, uh, <laughs> a, a professor of forestry who... who um, but, but, I mean, to your point about substitution of exports, then we've looked at, instead of sending iron or mm. iron offshore, bauxite or alumina, alumina sending aluminium offshore, our projections for biomass availability are drawn from CSIRO reports and so on. Um, that's about the level sum of what I know about, about forest products and other things, but would, pro would Professor Rod Keenan, Professor of Forestry, like to say a thing or two? <laughs> um, yeah, congratulations to the whole team. It's been great to be a small part of this project. Uh, I don't think we're looking, Deb, at the trade-off between land use for agriculture and for solar and energy and wind. I think you can see where um, a lot of the solar was planned, there isn't necessarily big agricultural productivity and wind can be integrated. So we're not really seeing that, that trade-off um, or anticipating that that would be a, a large-scale trade-off as part of the model. Thank, thank you for that. A, a question online on uh, capital investment. Um, we mentioned that there would be unprecedented capital investment uh, needed, uh, and I don't want to uh, downplay that. Um, what are the views on the relative role for government versus the private sector? And I might throw this to Chris Gregg, 
who, of course, has the experience of looking at this sort of question also for the North American study. Chris, please. Yeah, so I guess I think, I think about it the same way for Australia as I did for the US. I think the majority of capital will come from the private sector. Um, that's a given. I think the, the, the role of the state or the governments is really around de-risking the mobilisation of that capital. Um, you know, getting out of the way where capital is flowing freely, but then intervening, understanding where the roadblocks and the friction of mobilising it is occurring, and that's what I think the critical role for government will be. And that's pretty much what in the in so-called Inflation Reduction Act that they tried to do in the US as well. So I'm looking for hands. Um, Professor Alan Finkel, uh, the until recently Chief Scientist of Australia. Down the front, please. Ah, OK, we'll come back to you next. Uh, hi, uh, Alan Finkel. Um, I don't have a question about what you've reported because I think the work you've done is absolutely fantastic, flawless, and needs to be published, so congratulations. But I do have a question about where you might go in future. Uh, because of the COVID-related workforce shortages, we had supply chain problems in 2021 because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We've got serious energy supply chain problems now. I'm just wondering whether you think that your models could in future uh, be used to look at perturbations, like if we lose our access to cobalt globally, if we lose our access to polysilicon, if we lose our access to nickel, because these are some of the things that are very, very constrained in the sense that there's no diversity of supply at the moment. Would your model be extendable? Because it's, it's going to be a really important issue. You can't predict what the perturbation will be, but you could try some. Simon, do you want to comment on that? Um. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a great question and it's a great, um, it's a great thought. And in fact, one of the things that we, we keep thinking about when we see the world as it is now versus the world when we started is to consider um, you know, the impacts of those changes. And we have, we have a lot of plans to run a, a range of sensitivities that are laid out within the work as it stands at the moment. Um, and for uh, a number of those that you suggested and probably others that will, you know, I think there's a very large list of things that, questions that people will have. Um, and so I think those sensitivities are things that we will try and incorporate where we can within the timeline that we've got. And then beyond the length of the study, I think, you know, the tools that we've developed here across the four partners could be used to look at those kinds of, you know, pro to provide some, I guess, you know, information, to help decisions, you know, based on what we find. So whilst the microphone's being handed up uh, here uh, on my left and just before you start, I've got one that is so easy that I can answer it. Uh, and the question is on nuclear, if it's technology new neutral, why no consideration of nuclear power? Uh, and we have actually answered that. I presume the question was written before uh, we got to that point. Uh, we will consider nuclear as a sensitivity. So there will be a result in there for nuclear. Now, please, from the floor, up on this side, I think. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jenny Shen. I'm a management consultant, also working in energy transition and climate. Um, so my question is for the modelling leads. Um, so a slight, slight tangent. Um, so thinking about grid security, um, what we're seeing is essentially more frequent once-in-a-lifetime extreme events. So thinking about the snow that caused blackout in Texas, thinking about the recent drought in China, essentially shutting down hydropower, and obviously, you know, the floods in New South Wales and Queensland. Just wondering how and whether extreme or the increased frequency of extreme weather events have been considered in the modelling of um, new generation battery and transmission lines. Michael, please. That one. We, we haven't included those in the modelling yet, and the very simple reason why is that if we did that formally, properly, and it's a very important thing to do, uh, we wouldn't have a computer big enough to solve the problem uh, within a year of starting the project. So uh, you're, you're a pretty 
can you model that by the sounds of it yourself? So you're talking about stochastic planning in general using you know, high impact, low probability events, yada, yada, yada. It's a very important extension of this kind of work um, that, that needs to be looked at um, very seriously. Uh, I saw earlier in the week uh, the, the Loire River in France is, is a dry bed. I remember 25 years ago standing next to it and, I, and I, as a 25 year old I couldn't run fast enough to keep up with it. So, mm. yeah, Michael, please a question here. Catherine Fagg, Chair of CSIRO. Chris, I'm really interested to know the compare and contrast between the work in America and in Australia. What, your, what are the differences that you're seeing? So, so um, remarkably similar, actually, in terms of the scale. So the sort of terawatts of wind and solar um, is what we find in the US, but of course we didn't have this massive export economy to deal with. Mm. Um, but they're quite similar. Um, more balance between wind and solar, whereas it's very dominated by solar in the Australian modelling. Um, in a renewable constrained world, large dependence on CCS. Um, we did allow nuclear, and so in that renewable constrained world, we had a lot of nuclear deployment as well. Um, I think the other striking th uh, difference is this notion of these large solar hubs, whereas the, the energy assets were more evenly distributed across the country. And then the last one is probably around bioenergy. The US has much stronger potential for, for bioenergy. So, I mean, I think that, that makes the job a lot easier um, because you get those negative emissions. But they're, they're probably the, a lot of similarities in terms of scale and speed. And the capital numbers are coming out roughly the same. Uh, so it's really interesting. So let me take one uh, from online. It's a question about water. And uh, surely what we're doing here requires huge amounts of water. And we would certainly all agree with that. Um, how do we uh, supply this water? Do we include modeling of desalination in it? I think that one's fairly uh, easy, actually. Simon. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And it's a great consideration for um, you know something uh, of this scale, um, particularly when green hydrogen, the electrolysis of water to produce hydrogen, um, features so prominently in all of, in four out of the five scenarios. So absolutely we are considering water, um, as you'll read in the, in the mass pack online. Um, we consider for the most part, uh, for the majority of those export zones, um, uh, coastal desalination of water. There is one node uh, where we are looking at inland, uh, you know, uh, purifying inland water for the for the hydrogen electrolyzers. But absolutely, it's being considered um, from the, um, and this will come out more in the later stages of the modelling. Okay, if I could move to our right. Um, hi, Alison. This be BASF. Um, I suppose. Following on from Professor Finkel's question, I'm wondering about uh, the level of granularity within the storage mechanisms. Um, you mentioned pumped hydro and battery. I'm wondering if we go into any more, if there's any more detail of um, the types of batteries and the role of different battery technologies um, within your modelling. So, Michael, uh, over to you. So, um, short, short answer is we, we've got relatively <coughs> simple models of each of the types of energy storage. So different battery chemistries, certainly not. Different battery storage durations, uh, there is that we do optimise the battery storage duration and, and, and the pumped hydro and other things. Um, where our hydrogen storage, we model as engineered underground formations, so is built stuff, not natural stuff, because at the time when we looked at that, we weren't confident how much natural stuff would hold hydrogen. Now, that could well change. Um, and uh, engineered formations are more expensive, but we still find with that kind of approach um, very substantial hydrogen storage, as along with the other stuff as well. So there's heterogeneity of storage, and you really do need heterogeneity, particularly of duration. Um, um, and it will only get harder if you start worrying uh, about really serious droughts and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for that. Let me take one from uh, online, and it's on CCUS, or CCS if you want to abbreviate it. And I'm going to throw this one uh, to Chris Gregg. Chris, um, does CCUS in what we're doing include uh, BEX? Um, uh, that's, uh, you well know the names. Um, has there been an analysis of what we would required for CCUS to successfully capture carbon in the long term? So this is somebody querying really the validity of uh, using CCS here. Or do we just assume that it was a viable uh, option? Um, will existing coal-fired power plants in Australia be kept on standby with optional power with CCS? So CCS in general, BEX, and are we going to keep coal fire there with CCS? I guess um, CCS is, is a nascent technology. Um, there are, there's a, a fair few demonstrations around the world, but it's tough tech, right? Um, and so it's going to take time to scale up. It's going to need support. But, you know, we're seeing in the US, in the Middle East and the UK now really strong support for CCS and, and quite a number of demonstration projects starting to come on. So, so I think... We have a lot of confidence that it's doable. Um, the then next question is about where you store the, uh, the CO2. Um, so to that end, you know, we did quite a lot of analysis. We did a lot of engagement with industry. So most of the oil and gas actors and most of the people who are pursuing CCS in Australia now, we had very deep discussions with them about the potential that to scale this up and to what level by 2050. So I think... Um, you know, in our base scenarios where we've got the 150 million, I would say it's completely plausible and, and the industry actors we spoke to were, were confident about that. The, the high level is an ambitious level, right? Um, so we don't have strong views about the, you know, how easy that's going to be, but, but it's doable. So a question from the floor on this side. Hi. Claire Savage here from the Australian Energy Regulator. Thanks for sharing your work with us tonight. It's really very interesting. And uh, I'd probably just make the comment, Michael, that the integrated system plan does have a hydrogen export scenario, but it's obviously solving within the, the NEM itself. The thing that struck me about your map, um, clearly we could see the big export hubs in Northwest Shelf and in Northern Queensland. But I guess as an energy regulator, the bit that frightened me was the big cross-country transmission line. So I was a little bit interested just in the economics in the modelling of, of what brought on cross-country transmission as opposed to decentralised solutions. So, you know, um, I guess decentralised generation with storage or localised storage. So Ma Michael, I think, for that. <laughs> it frightened us too, Claire. <laughs> um, and, and we were surprised when it came out. Um, so, so here, here's another little secret why they're interim maps. We, we, when we first did it, we thought, well, no one will want an inter a, cross, a cross continental hydrogen transmission pipe, so we'll, we'll suppress that in the modelling, and then we got cross continental electricity transmission instead. So, we have to go back and look at some of that stuff. In, 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 in all transparency, we have to look at that. But we do have an awful lot of DER. I think. I can't remember the exact numbers. Dominic, I'm looking at you and asking you 50 gigawatts of rooftop solar about, right? 70 gigawatts. So on 10 million homes, that's probably pretty much everybody having rooftop PV. So there's an awful lot of distributed energy resource in there, and that's in, the, in those capacity maps as well. But, you know, as you well know, Claire, that you can get any answer you want from modelling and... and, and, and when you look in particular at uh, transmission planning, you, you know, th things are very, very complicated very, very quickly. Mm. We did use our costs from the ISP, and now that you point out that there's hydrogen export in the latest ISP, I do remember and stand corrected, so thank you. <laughs> okay, movi moving on, and uh, a couple from uh, online. Uh, one, uh, Richard, I'll address uh, to you because it is pointing forward uh, into the mobilisation uh, work. Capital. The global north has access to nearly all the capital in the world. Unprecedented capital investment will understandably make global south. By global, I think they mean uh, Australian and indigenous communities very nervous. How will this transition be just? in the sense of social and equitably just. 
Well, the easy answer to that is that's what we're going to look at over the next uh, year or so. Um, I think it just validates that the, the question validates the point that we can't simply look at this as an investment task. It's a social task and it's a, uh, a, a, and one that applies to, to uh, workforces, to various industry sectors, certainly to First Nations peoples, if they're not engaged with the amount of, mobile, of, of capital that we are talking about then there will be just fight after fight. There'll be governments will, will potentially lose office. There's quite a difficult scenario if not handled well. That's not a prediction, by the way, because uh, as has been said several times, the future is what we will make it. And it is clearly possible to turn potential adversity into advantage, but it's going to require a very strong partnership approach. That's kind of preempting the, the work that we're, uh, that we're about to do, but I think it's not a hard conclusion to draw. And while I've got the uh, microphone as somebody who helped negotiate the establishment of AEMO, if I can perhaps broker the answer on that. AEMO doesn't have, its purview is the interconnected grids of, uh, of eastern and southeastern Australia and southwest uh, Australia. It has no purview where those solar zones are, and that's the one reason they have no renewable zones that match any of that, but that's not in any sense a conflict between AEMO and this project. So, one if I could, um, uh, I think, Simon, to you from uh, our online uh, viewers on energy efficiency, and we did touch on this in the uh, presentations, um, we don't seem to have incorporated an aggressive energy efficiency productivity action. Would you like to comment? Um, so, energy efficiency, so as I talked about before, there are, there are two components to that, that uh, change in final energy demand in terms of um, the electrification, which provided around 60% of the reduction in final energy demand reference to the base case, and then the energy efficiency, which provided about 40% of that difference. Um, we have actually uh, incorporated... Um, I don't know whether I'd call it aggressive, but they're certainly not conservative um, efficiency gains across the, um, the timeline, and I believe that they're in line with the Net Zero America, Pretty similar. Uh, Net Zero America uh, approach in that regard. And I'd also add that the re even the reference case has, um, it's, it's not like business as usual means no improvement in, in energy efficiency. In that case, energy efficiency is included in the reference case as well, and it's um, much more substantial in the... Um, in the, uh, in the net zero cases. And the precise numbers are given in the mass pack. Um, I don't have them top to mind right now, but people can look there for those precise numbers. So it is incorporated. All 200 pages of it. A question on the right here, please. Hey, well, a very interesting study. I'm Chong Wong from Melbourne Climate Future and Monash. Um, my question is, is related to part dependency, also the optimal locations for those investments. So um, I'm more interested in your modeling approach, whether you optimize the whole 30 years period in one planning span or you do every five years. Because if you do every five years, probably you're going to lock in some infrastructure that only delivers short-term value, but not long-term uh, value. But also interesting to, uh, you know, so then comes to my question, like whether you should um, have electrolysis within the natural electricity market or it's from the pure bar and more re uh, remote areas? What's the impact of those, uh, system impact of those electrolysis, you know, to the consumer electricity price and to the, uh, to the uh, grid service? Because um, they can be very responsible, um, f responsive uh, to manage the grid frequency, for example. So... Yes, yeah, Simon. Yeah, so, um, in terms of the modelling, it's, it's, uh, we do everything in five yearly time steps, but the model does have perfect foresight mm. towards over, across the whole time period. Um, so there, there are elements of, of path dependency that do get built in. Um, in terms of your question around the impact of you know, the, those northern export zones on electricity consumers or, or, or consumers down in, in you know, our where we are right now. Um, so there, there is some interaction between the domestic and the export systems, um, but the size of the exports, it, it can be disaggregated. Um, 
will, will split apart. And so the majority of the export activity is for export. Um, there is some balancing that happens between the two systems. So some of those costs, you know, you can argue which way they need to get um, allocated. Um, but by and large, you know, even though it is, you know, very well connected with multiple intercontinental transmission lines, as was pointed out before, the two systems stay largely separate. Thanks for that. I'll take one from uh, online, and um, I'll perhaps throw it to you, Kath, uh, because it's a general uh, uh, question, and you're not allowed to answer with a simplistic, uh, with difficulty. Uh, it's a question on employment, um, and very pointed. The top end struggles to attract labour. Populations are small, and post-COVID has restricted international skills migrants. How will people be trained, and how are we going to get people to this top end? Right. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> My challenge to Rowan was actually to not have an, a question directed to me, but never mind. So it's about making the opportunities available uh, to people, right? This is not an easy task, and you're going to an area in the north where progressively it's going to become more adverse and hostile to human um, habitation, as we talked about earlier. So how do you train up the people to... How do you train people up to actually see it as an opportunity how do we make communities that are actually accessible and support people's aspirations? How do you give people what, what um, a good quality of work? These are all just motherhood statements. I appreciate that. The answer is actually in having education for, forefront in, in our population. With education, the ability to come up with technological changes, with the ability to do those higher paid jobs, to actually grow communities is fundamental. It does come down to policy, it does come down to um, institutions being able to support the young people to actually see that there's merit in, in that sort of training. But also, what about the um, hands-on uh, trades, the sparkies that we need to have up there. You would have seen in the, in the paper and the press recently that actually the need for electricians is going to be quite extraordinary as we convert to um, electrification. Mm -hmm. I think I would just, um, speak a little bit around the uh, FIFO versus community. So FIFO's had uh, problems up in the north. There's a move to try and build communities there and, and to avoid the problems that come with that. This is not a small challenge. It come, I, I'm going to just riff on that a little bit further, but <laughs> you give me the microphone. I won't give it back. <laughs> um, but you know, this is this is with with difficulty and with that, with population moving north. What does that mean for national security? What does that mean for migration? These are all big, wicked problems that we're looking at. But actually, you know, they're quite important to start thinking about now in the same way that we have to start thinking about capital investment now. Net zero is possible. Net zero by 2050 is quite a eye-watering exercise. Thanks for that. And uh, I think we have a question in the centre here. Uh, yes, uh, Obed Kukange, um, energy market analyst with Engie. Uh, so my question actually follows on the issue of high-paying jobs. Why are they high paying and um, how do we ensure they remain high paying, especially in the face of potential automation and the fact that maybe some of these jobs are right now not high paying. So why are they high paying and how will they remain high paying some of these jobs? Michael, I think. Uh, <coughs> so th there's two short answers to, to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you go online to the website and go into the employment modelling uh, uh, paper, it talks about that. So um, if we assume for a moment we've got enough workers we want to do everything we need, big assumption, uh, mm -hmm. that then there is a, 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 a slight increase in the skill level from current energy sector jobs to those in the future. Um, so, so you would therefore expect... Um, you know, very large growth in the number of electricians and so on, that you would therefore expect uh, uh, 
salaries, wages to increase because the jobs are more skilled. That's a good news story. Um, then on top of that, of course, is that you get the very strong effect that if you have a finite job market, mm. then everybody's salaries will go up if those jobs are very much in demand. So um, we, we think we would be very confident that these are skilled, secure, um, uh, interesting and well-paid jobs in the future. Um, if we can get enough people to do them, they hopefully won't be exorbitantly well-paid. Mm. Um, but good news for skilled and interesting jobs. So, Michael, while you're in a fine form there, I'll give you one from uh, online, but in a totally different direction. Um, how much direct air capture are we talking about in the models, given that we're not expecting the agricultural waste, Lulu CF, to be picking up very much other than getting its own net emissions down? I'll, I'll ask Simon to answer that one. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Um, so, direct air capture is significant in, uh, across all the scenarios. Um, in three out of the... Uh, it is the predominant source of CO2 um, in uh, four out of the five. So, all of the... Uh, everything except the case where um, renewables build is constrained and, and we have to... We, we move to a blue hydrogen uh, future. Um, even in the renewable, fully renewables case, we're talking on the order of uh, nearly 100 to 150 million tonnes a year, um, and which a lot of that goes towards uh, storage, as we saw in the chart. And then as we move out to uh, 2050 and 2060, we see that um, about half as much, again, is used um, to create carbon feedstocks um, for liquid fuels and chemicals and a range of other, uh, you know, reasons why we need, why we use carbon. Um, so, yeah, it's, hopefully that illustrates it. Thanks for that. Right up the back here, I think. Uh, David Brockway, formerly of CSIRO. Um, the um, data that you showed uh, to do with the cost of energy in the future in all the scenarios, except the business as usual, shows a substantial increase in the cost of energy. Um, that's just one side of it. There was some work that CSIRO did a few years ago, which also looked at the um, value of that energy as a proportion of the wealth of households. And it actually found at the time, and this is before we had uh, plateauing uh, or flatlining wages, but in any event, it showed that the, um, even with the higher cost of energy in current dollar terms, the proportion of wealth of the family that's actually, or an individual, that's actually spent on energy was actually reducing. So is your modelling going to look at any of that sort of aspect at all? It's hard to do, I know, because you've got to look at the, the overall wealth of an individual of the family. But it, it, if, if you don't do something like that, you're going to scare a lot of politicians. I don't want to be too political, Robin, but you're going to scare a lot of politicians. We're politically neutral, as you've uh, noticed, um, and to sort of labour the point, we're Catholic, spelt with a small c. And for those of you that don't actually know the meaning of the word, look it up. Uh, small, we're small c Catholic here, and it's nothing to do with religion. Uh, a comment, perhaps... Um, I'm I'll jump in. It's a bit dangerous to give me the microphone. <laughs> I think my, my, I'll, I'll set up the, the framework and then allow others to speak to it. So what we see with the energy transition is actually the capital spend is, is the high point and then once you actually build what you need, the operating costs come down. So I think that's probably a feature to think about, you know, when you go forward and, and the proportion of the, how much is spent on energy costs. But that first step of actually putting in place what you need is quite extraordinary. And, and so, I mean, Simon showed the slide with the total cost normalised by GDP. Yeah. That could be normalised by domestic yeah. household income or other things. Mm -hmm. So that was showing that total costs stay flat or fall, um, mm. and we're using all these uh, projections that various agencies have already made. I will make one other uh, point, though. The costs we're talking about here aren't just the energy bills. 
they include the costs of the new appliances that will mm. consume that energy. So it includes the EVs, it includes the heat pumps, it includes the induction cooker, not just the electricity that comes to your door or the hydrogen that comes to your door. Mm. And so that analysis, are, they, are, they are indeed big numbers, but as a fraction of GDP, we're not seeing them go up and they include more than just the cost of delivered energy to the, to the front gate. We've got quite a few, quite an extraordinary number of questions uh, online, and my guess is that we're going to be answering uh, quite a few of them by email in the follow-up um, uh, to this. Um, but let me just pick uh, a couple of them before we get through to last uh, burning questions uh, from you who have made it out in a Melbourne winter. Um, one of them is, uh, and perhaps Chris, you might uh, care to uh, comment on this. Um, should we be looking at a scenario where instead of onshoring uh, iron, iron ore through to iron and aluminium, we actually look at higher value products to use the energy to make higher value uh, products? Any comment? Good. Um, it's not currently in the plan, but we, you know, we'd welcome any suggestions for new scenarios, and um, we're certainly able to, to look at those sorts of things. And this one has been mentioned a few times, um, but it comes up in a few of the questions. What's the relative role of electrons versus molecules? <laughs> Simon? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting question, and um, I'll speak to it only in terms of the way in which uh, we transport energy around the country. Um, and so, uh, and it, it, I guess it plays out most um, obviously in the export uh, zones and the, those large renewable energy export zones. And we, along with a, a range of other uh, groups and reports that are already out there in the public, find that it is cheaper to move molecules than it is to, to move electrons through transmission. So the, um, those maps that you see there uh, indicate um, that there are still transmission connections between the renewable energy zones and the export ports. Um, and accompanying them that aren't shown on the map yet because we haven't done the downscaling are also water pipelines to take the water from the coast to the electro electrolyzers and then uh, hydrogen pipelines to take that hi the hydrogen that's been made back to the coast. And like a number of other groups, we find that um, moving the molecules is far cheaper, actually, than moving the electrons at the scale that we're talking. And uh, because one of the questions we don't have time to answer was about where does all the water come from? And the answer is it's desalinated water. And so some of your low emission energy has to go into desalinating water and then shifting it as molecules to where the electrons are so you can push the molecules of hydrogen back. I think the last two questions from the floor, and I can't see who's got the uh, microphone. One right up the back, please. Hello. Uh, Lenin here, uh, currently studying the, the Master of Energy Systems, which uh, Michael founded some years ago. And uh, I guess the question adds on the, on the side of the workforce, internationals, uh, labor. Uh, me pr being a, a proud uh, Unimel uh, international student right now, and uh, having also uh, be, being fortunate enough to be doing one of the Melbourne Energy Institute uh, zero emission energy internships, um, I guess the, the, the question is, what role are we going to be playing into this project that you have and into this modeling? What role will internationals be playing in this game plan and these scenarios that you are uh, generating? I'll answer. Thank you for that very generous introduction as well. <laughs> um, 20, 20 years ago, I started here as a lecturer my then boss, now retired, Professor Dorian Thomas, said, sleep faster. That was her advice to me 20 years ago. Now, I can't say that to you now because that would be breaking oh and uh, requirements at this <laughs> university. But the short answer is there's going to be so much work for everybody. And, and a key point to your degree in particular is the heterogeneity of the, of the roles. So uh, we started up that degree 10 years ago because engineers weren't very good at non-engineering stuff and, and, and 
economics and science graduates and arts graduates didn't have a strong technical understanding of the system. And so that kind of qualification, I think, I hope, will become much, much more in demand and the graduates from that kind of qualification. UQ's actually got a yes, similar do, qualification do, that Chris established before he went off to Princeton, uh, I think. Um, oh, there are going to be lots of great jobs for, for, for ambitious and hard-working young people. Lots of them. And there already are, I think, probably fair to say. Thanks, Michael. And now the last question is up the back again. Hi there. Thank you. Uh, Joe Sanson from Climate Work Centre. My question is a bit broader, which is if and how you've taken into account the global warming implications of these scenarios. Net zero by 2050 doesn't necessarily seem Paris aligned. Thank you for that. Uh, Simon, I think it's certainly not a moving target. We do incorporate, but you might mention just how. Yeah, so um, in terms of the climate impacts, we've modelled the RCP uh, 8.5 scenario. Um, that, that, that incorporate in, in terms of um, the way in which that, uh, those numbers play into our modelling, uh, hot days, cold days, um, impacts uh, and other impacts within the model. Um, and then in terms of whether, uh, I guess, the, I would say that we are, that the five scenarios that we've modelled and the net zero by 2050 is broadly consistent with the one and a half to two degrees of the Paris uh, Agreement. So. Thank you. Role within it. Thank you for that. And now, in closing the session um, on time, even though we started a fraction of time late, uh, I would thank you all for coming. I would thank uh, our online uh, people likewise. I apologise we uh, haven't had time to go through all of the online questions. We will attempt to address them to the extent that we can and uh, take uh, ad advice uh, and comments uh, and questions. So you now have the uh, website that you can use and you can use that. It has links through to contact us uh, and we will leave it at that. I'll ask now um, uh, Michael Breer uh, to formally pack us off and tell us what we have to do next. I'll be very brief, and I'm acting now with a slightly different hat on. That is my job during the day, which is Director of the Melbourne Energy Institute at this university. So on behalf of the university, Professor Maskell, uh, the Net Zero Australia project team, I thank all of you for attending tonight, uh, all of you in person. It's just so great to see real people in large numbers at these events. I'm loving being at work again, as we all are. And I better thank all of you online, not to diminish your online presence, of course. Um, I would like to thank most sincerely the NZA advisory group um, for their support throughout. It's been quite wonderful. Uh, uh, and also the project team, the steering committee and the workers, the, uh, their modelers, the analysts, um, re remarkable level of collaboration and, and, and efforts to date. But there are a couple of people who really made tonight possible. Richard mentioned, mentioned some of them. Anita La Rosa, MEI's Institute Manager, Franca Tamaris, uh, Tom Strawhorn from NAUS, who have helped us so much, particularly over the last few days. You would be astounded how much work it is in organising an event like this. But the postdocs and students who have done so much excellent work over the last one and a half years, and will continue to do a lot. Uh, uh, thank you very much, all of you. We now have drinks and canapes in the foyer for those of us in person tonight. If you're at home, you can have a toasty or something like that. You're all welcome to join us, so good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.